The day spring from on high hath visited us to give light unto them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Dayspring is an effort to be in touch with good people who love God and who believe that the Bible is His Word. Dayspring is brought to you by your neighbors from churches of Christ in this area. And now, visit with us as we draw near to God. My prayer is that all's well with you. We're delighted you've chosen to spend some time with us. This is Dayspring. We study the Bible together. We're so glad people like you enjoy that as we uplift God's Word, hold it high, and encourage others to open its pages. If we live by it, then we will be doing what God wants us to do. We appreciate you so much and your willingness to take part in what we do. I'm reading today a passage from 1 Peter chapter 3. I shall begin reading at verse 18 and read through verse 21. If your Bible is nearby, perhaps you'll want to open it to that passage and read along with us. 1 Peter 3, beginning at verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. When sometime, when once the long-suffering of God uh, waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's that great passage from 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 21. One phrase in that passage to which I call your attention. It's in verse 18, verse 21. The like figure, the like figure. Let our minds dwell on that phrase for a few moments today. The like figure is a translation of a word that if it were transliterated would be tra the uh, anti-type. The anti-type. Baptism is a like figure it is the antitype of something else. The antitype means that it corresponds to something in the past, something that has gone before. The type is in the past. Now the fulfillment of that type takes place, and it's the antitype. The type back there and the antitype now. That was the type. This is the antitype. Baptism is an antitype of something in the past. It is the fulfillment of a type. Romans chapter 4, chapter 5, at verse 14, helps us maybe understand that just a little bit. In chapter 5 and verse 14 of Romans, Paul wrote, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam was the type. That's the word. 
In the original language, if it had been transliterated instead of translated, it would have been type. Adam was a type. Jesus, the antitype. Adam, the father of all the physical race. Christ, the head of the spiritual family of God. Adam is a type. Jesus is the antitype. In our text before us in 1 Peter 3, Noah's salvation is the type, and baptism is the antitype. That phrase in 1 Peter 3 is rendered in other English versions like this. The English Standard Version says that baptism corresponds to this. Baptism corresponds to Noah's salvation. The American Standard says that baptism is a true likeness of this. It is the likeness of what has already taken place. Another English version says that baptism corresponds, is corresponding to that. So there is the type and there is the antitype something that happened in the past. Now, something in the present corresponds to that. It's called the type and the antitype. The type is a form or a figure or a pattern. The antitype follows it. Now get this. This is the crux of our matter. The salvation of Noah Back in Genesis chapter 6 beginning, the salvation of Noah is pictured here as the type of our salvation through Christ. The type is the salvation of Noah. The antitype is our salvation through Christ. And that helps us understand remarkably what's going on here. Christ our salvation is the antitype of Noah and his salvation, which is the type. Now let's read that carefully. Verse 21. The like figure, that is, the antitype. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us. Baptism doth also now save us. Like Noah was saved from a sin-cursed world through the waters of a flood that picked his ark up out of that sin-cursed world and held it aloft while the earth was purged of its wickedness. And then that same water lowered him back down into the world that had been cleaned. The like figure, water, doth also now save us. Baptism, the water of baptism, doth also now save us. It's interesting to note from that passage that nothing else is said about our salvation. Baptism is said to save us. Is it baptism alone? Well, nothing else is mentioned. Faith is not mentioned. Repentance is not mentioned. Should we therefore conclude that we are saved by baptism only? You can see that that would not be a good, safe conclusion. Now let's read some other passages. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified, made innocent. In other words, we're saved by faith. What else? Nothing else is mentioned. Just faith is mentioned. Can we conclude from that that it's faith only? Faith alone is what saves us and justifies us before God? Well, in Acts chapter 16, at verse 31, a jailer was told, 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Anything else? Just believe is mentioned. Just that alone. Nothing else is mentioned. Shall we conclude that that man's salvation was by believing only? You may recall that great text, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Does that passage teach that we are saved by believing only? Nothing else is mentioned. There is no, nothing else mentioned in that text, just believing. Just like in Acts 16 and verse 31. Just like in Romans 5 and verse 1 and in other passages in the New Testament. It is written in the creed books throughout our land that faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. From whence did that teaching come? It did not come from the Bible. Because the Bible nowhere says that salvation is by faith only. In fact, the opposite of that is said. You see then how that a man is justified not by faith only. Well, now let's go back to 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Baptism doth also now save us. If we can conclude that the passages which mention faith with nothing else means that we're saved by faith alone, then we can take this passage in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 and affirm that we are saved by baptism alone. You understand that none or neither of those conclusions is sound. It's not by faith only. It's not by baptism only. We take all the Bible says about our salvation. Truth of the matter, the Bible pictures Noah as believing. Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says, By faith Noah, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So there's faith in another passage. Our passage in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 just says baptism. But uh, in other places we read about the fact that Noah was a believer. But please notice, my friend, as we turn back to that account in Genesis chapter 6, that Noah was not saved the moment he believed. In Genesis chapter 6 at verse 14, here's the instruction that God gave Noah. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the wet breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou finish it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the earth breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, and thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female of the fowl of the air after their kind, cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come with thee unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, 
and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now Noah believed in God before the ark was built. Noah believed in God before the flood came. Noah was said to be a good man before all of this transpired. But at what point in time was Noah saved from the flood? He was saved from the flood when he did what God told him to do. When he followed God's instructions and he built that ark to the dimensions God said build it. After the fashion God said build it. He followed God's blueprint, his pattern. And only after he had obeyed God and entered into that ark was he saved. He was saved from that the judgment of God on the crest of that uh, liquid wave. Thus, he was not saved at the moment he believed, but he was saved when he did what God told him to do. There is in that a tremendous lesson for us. We're saved when we've done what God tells us to do to be saved. Now I have a question, a question that is very timely. Saved, how? The like figure, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Save us. How? From what? Somebody says that means we're saved from persecutions. Baptism certainly did not protect people from persecution. In fact, it may have caused more persecution to be heaped upon them. That's not an adequate explanation of that salvation. Well, somebody says, it's salvation from sickness and disease. How could that be? Because the record clearly furnishes us with an abundance of evidence that baptized people were as sick and as diseased as people who were not baptized, just like they were persecuted just like people who were not baptized. We're not saved from persecution, not saved from sickness and disease. Then how are we saved? Somebody says that means salvation in heaven at last. But listen carefully to the way the text reads. The like figure whereunto salvage, salvage baptism doth also now save us. Now, in the present tense. Not after a while in heaven itself, but now, in this present time, we are saved. Saved from what then? If not saved from persecution, if not saved from sickness, if not saved at last in heaven, then how? Not symbolically. The word symbol doesn't, isn't mentioned in that text. Baptism is not a symbol of something. Baptism saves us. Well, Peter, who wrote these words, perhaps furnished us with a commentary on it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, these are Peter's words on that occasion. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Question, Peter, why did you instruct those people to repent and be baptized? The answer, for the remission of sins. That is, in order to receive forgiveness. That's why they were to be baptized. Saved from what? Saved from the guilt of sin. The Great Commission, according to Luke's record, given by Jesus to these apostles, of whom Peter was one, reads like this, uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 46, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer 
and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. What is it they're supposed to preach? Repentance and remission of sins. Now Peter heard that. Peter was there when Jesus gave that great commission. And so later when he told those people on Pentecost to, believe, to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, he was repeating what he heard in the great commission. And then sometime later, when Peter wrote this great epistle, 1 Peter 3, at verse 21, he said, The like figure, the antitype, baptism, doth also now save us. Save us how, Peter? Save us from the guilt of our sins. If we want our sins remitted, if we want our sins forgiven, then it's necessary for us to be baptized. Baptism is the antitype of the flood which saved Noah from that sin-cursed world, the type and the antitype. Now listen to this text. <clears throat> the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. That's clear, isn't it? We don't, we don't, un don't misunderstand that. It's so clear we can't misunderstand it. Baptism is necessary in order to be saved. We understand that just like in Noah's day, God was the one who saved. God is the, sa the Savior, but he tells us what to do in order to be saved. And then Peter added these words, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. That's not what baptism is all about not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Now somebody says, the filth of the flesh is sin. And therefore what Peter says is, you're baptized, but it's not to put away sin. But my friend, that's not what that text says. You have to twist and warp and add to to make it say something else. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. An explanation, perhaps, is necessary because when a person is baptized, uh, you don't want to misunderstand its purpose. It's not to put away the filth of the flesh. This English version of that text reads like this. This was a figure of the washing which now saves you, not the removal of the dirt from the body. There's the idea. You should not misunderstand the purpose of baptism. It's not to remove the dirt from your body. And just so, in another English version of the scriptures, it's made to read like this. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. What does that mean? We're not baptized to bathe our bodies. That is to say, baptism is not for the purpose of removing the dirt and the grime from our bodies. That explanation was needed because baptism was an immersion. I'm aware that many people in our religious world today practice uh, sprinkling and pouring. If that had been the design of baptism in the New Testament, this explanation would have been unnecessary. You do not sprinkle a little water on someone's head to remove the dirt from their body anyway. But there was this possible misunderstanding. When you're immersed in water, perhaps the main purpose of it is to take a bath, to wash the, the dirt from your body. Peter says in his explanation, that is not the purpose of baptism. Since baptism is an immersion, don't misunderstand it. It is not to remove the dirt from the body. The filth of the flesh is the way Peter said it in our King James Version. Not 
the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. The answer of a good conscience toward God. There's an interesting phrase as well. When I'm baptized, that is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Perhaps uh, I should read that from another English version. This English version says, uh, the earnest request to God for a clear conscience. When I'm baptized in obedience to his command, I'm making a request to God for me to have a clear conscience in that matter. I'm an honest man. I have done what the Bible teaches me to do to be saved. I have been baptized. And in doing that, I am requesting God to give me a clear conscience in that matter. And so, so this text says, it is uh, an appeal to God for a good conscience. When I'm baptized in obedience to his command that I might be saved, it is an appeal to God for me to have a good conscience in that matter. I'm honest. I want to do what God's told me to do in order to be saved. And therefore, I am immersed in water, not to bathe my body from its filth, but to appeal to God for me to have a clear conscience in that matter. I have been baptized the way the Lord taught me to be so that I could be saved. Thank you for being our guest today. We've enjoyed our visit. Until the next time, may the goodness of God be yours in full measure. You've been watching Dayspring. Dayspring is brought to you by your friends in local area churches of Christ. To request a free CD of today's lesson, you may contact us at Dayspring, Post Office Box 453, Tupelo, Mississippi, 38802-0453. There is no cost for this offer. You will not be asked for financial support. You can also phone your request toll-free at 1-866-842-4139. Or you can go to our website at dayspringtv.com. Thank you for visiting with us on Dayspring. May your joy be full. May the peace of God rule in your hearts. And may the light of Christ brighten heaven's way. <laughs>